This uh, lecture is going to be on Hermann Hesse and ideology, colon, wild bird. I'd like to start with reading from a passage from Hesse's uh, life story briefly told. He says, I think that reality is the last thing one need bother oneself about, for it is tiresomely enough, constantly present, whereas it, it is the most beautiful and necessary things in life that really demand our attention and care. Reality is something that one ought not under any circumstances to be content with, and which one should not on any account worship and revere, for it is accidental, the leftovers of life. And the only way in which we can alter the shabby, consistently disappointing, and barren reality is by repudiating it and demonstrating that we are stronger than it is. So in Hermann Hess, we get this understanding of reality or a social reality or a reality which is presented to us as what is important to live by, what's significant for our identity, our desires and our longings to turn for. And yet these are bubbles on the water of life. They're passing, they're transient. Um, and so why would one give a, a lot of time and attention to them rather than a turning to the permanent things in that sense. This course in ideology and politics, as I mentioned in my first lecture, is about ideas and the logos, which is back of ideas. Logos, again, meaning that quest, that longing, that searching for meaning, for purpose at a personal, a familial, a friendship, a community, a political and economic level. And the ideas that we have that we think are going to bring us some sort of fulfillment, meaning, purpose, happiness, call it what, what you will. Uh, Herman Hess was very concerned with these sorts of questions uh, because we're in the sort of marketplace of ideas that we live in at the present time. There's many hawkers of meaning and they sell their products and we become consumers in that sense. We'll be watching a film in a couple of weeks called Century of the Self in which it looks at the transition increasingly so to identity by being defined by the consuming self. And so the transition which has gone on in terms of a lot of modern culture, the commodification of desires, the products which are sold to people, uh, which in many ways pacify them like a drug from uh, thinking more deeply about what reality is and what Hess is concerned about, and the, uh, the desire to th think through, see through, in that sense, uh, a, a much deeper reality which is worth living for. So ideas about reality is, on the one hand, the longings, the hungers, the thirsts we have for meaning, but asking ourselves, what are the ideas, conscious, subconscious, unconscious, which predetermine where we turn to in that search for meaning? This was a passion of Hermann Hesse most of his life. He was born in 1877 and died in 1962. He lived through some of the most tumultuous periods of world history, uh, born in Germany, southern Germany. And of course, Germany was at the center of so much in late 19th century, 20th century. Uh, he stood in many ways like the conscience of Germany, the conscience of Europe in many ways also in what he lived through and the issues that were thrown his way. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1946, largely because of a life of literary, artistic, ethical, political vision. And his great work, The Glass Bead Game, which I will come to at the end of this micro lecture, really summarized some of his concerns with the role of thinking and action. And what's the relationship of thinking at the most substantive levels or ideas on the mountain peak of pure thought? And how is that translated into the valley of activism? The mountain and the valley, the valley and the mountain, certainly one of those great classical mythic metaphors uh, solitude and action, silence and accountability. How does one live that particular tension? Well, that's in many ways the myth of the mountain valley we find in all great civilizations. The internal life, the introspective side, and then the extrovertive side, the engagement in the world. Some people just live in terms of the extrovertive side, not thinking a lot about the internal life. Others are very internal, and of course they can, if they're not careful, get lost in the maze of their own psyche and spirit. Uh, 
And so how does one in a mature way live, uh, live in sensitively, wisely in the house of the inner life? And how is that translated into uh, hospitality and action in the larger world itself? Herman Hesse explored all of these issues from his earliest journey until his death in 1962. I'm going to lightly stop and linger over a few of his published works. Obviously, the prolific nature of Hess can only be summarized in a short micro lecture like this, but at least I'll give you a taste for uh, his own journey. Let me start to break it from your reading, Herman Hesse, Phoenix Arising. Herman Hess in the 19, late 1950s 1960s, 1970s in North America, at least, was considered one of the most significant writers of the counterculture of that time. More than any other European writer, he played a significant role in, uh, in challenging what was going on. Uh, students were drawn to his understanding of Eastern spirituality, how education had become a, a formal curriculum that didn't speak to people's souls or longings anymore. Uh, one of his books is called Under the Wheel, in which young students came to school looking for wisdom and insight and how to live, and all they were given was authoritarian curriculum. This is how you to study. This is how you get marks. Do what you're told, and you move through the station stops of life, but don't ask questions about how this takes place. So his book Under the Wheel was it looked at how sensitive souls who are asking the bigger uh, questions are crushed by the curriculum wheel of public education at that time. But Hesse's first success work was Peter Kamenzi that came out in the early part of the 20th century. And what he looks at is uh, Peter himself grows up uh, in a family, somewhat dysfunctional. The mother, father, I mean, ideally marriage and romance is supposed to be something in which a couple, uh, initially after the blue sky phase and the sunny days, grow together in a more meaningful way. But the reality is often in many relationships is that husbands and wives cease to hear one another. They may stay together, uh, but they are apart in their lives. Obviously, others do fragment. They do separate and go their different directions. Uh, but there was the bourgeois vision uh, at the time that Herman Hess grew up. I might also add that his parents on both sides uh, came from very well-known German families, very engaged with India. And, uh, they're, they're, and Germany, by the 19th and 20th centuries, was one of the leading centers of the world in studies on India and Hinduism and Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity in India, obviously also. And so the Sikh tradition in India, in the Punjab, in that sense also. Uh, but Hesse, uh, so his, his first book, Peter Kamenzi, it looks in one sense at the myth of the bourgeois family in which it is supposed to be a context in which husband and wife uh, hear one another, they are there for one another, they support one another, on their journeys, they raise children, the children are ha healthy, they find their ways in a meaningful way through education, through work experiences, through public responsibility, through education, uh, religion. Uh, what Hess does with Peter Kamenzid, he says, life is not as sunny as it often appears. Uh, we've been sold to some degree a story which perhaps is not true to the reality of families versus the idealized notion of families. So Peter's first experience of life in the Alps, he grows up in a small village of the Alps, a, a sheltered and enclosed uh, setting in that sense, in which the bigger world is foreign to him, it's shut out. But his experience is a fairly insulated world, a cloistered world in that sense. And the, the pain of watching his mother and father's relationship faltering, uh, not being what he had hoped it would be, and then being by his mother's side as she dies, and his father is insensitively not even there for his mother in the midst of her final seasons and journey of life. He then leaves the little village of Nippicon in the Alps, and he begins to see there's a bigger world than the conditioning of the small village, the shire, similar to the hobbits in that way. And he begins to travel to a much bigger cultural world, intellectual world, the world of changes going on in the world, much being deconstructed, much being questioned. Um, and so we're into the world, of course, of ideology here, of whose version of the good life should one be committed to and why. Most people just accept 
the ideas given to them, and then their search for meaning is shaped within that framework, what Michel Foucault calls epistemy, the worldview people are given, they're often not questioned, and they just mindlessly, passively carry on, like, almost like in a matrix of sorts. There's not a great deal of thinking rather than asking, where did I get the ideas I did? Why do I believe what I do? Where do these things come from? And how long should I take them seriously when critically reflected on, or should they be taken seriously? And so Peter Kamazin is really the story of someone who, who was raised in a context, not always the happiest context, in fact, in some ways a painful context, uh, a family, an insulated world, and then he's exposed to a larger world. Uh, he enters the world of fairly sophisticated intellectual life of the big cities, uh, where cynicism abounds, where skepticism abounds, where the, you're reading some of the great writers of the 19th, uh, 20th century, which are raising questions about politics and religion and education and many other areas. And the issue is, uh, why would anyone take seriously some of these some of these things? And you get to get in the rise of the individual, the, in, the cynical individual, the skeptical individual, the nihilist in, individual who has sold a bill of goods by their culture, by their village, uh, by their political context. But they begin to see the duplicity, the hypocrisy of it all. And it raises within them a sense of who can I believe? What can I believe? And what direction do I take when belief in any meaningful sense becomes hard becomes hard to do? Uh, so much of Peter's journey in that sense, he, he, he enters an aesthetic world, uh, a highly sophisticated intellectual world in which cynicism and skepticism abounds, and it leads to paralysis, it leads to impotence in his own life. So he essentially becomes, and then the further he goes along with the cynicism, skepticism, the pointlessness, the aimlessness, he turns to drink, and he tries to numb his interior pain, his sense of pointlessness, helplessness through drink, and in time he comes to see that's equally a dead end, a cul-de-sac. He makes a trip to Italy in which he sees a lack of sophisticated people, uh, commoners in that sense, community, a vibrant community in Italy. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he sees, well, is intellectual dissection and sophistication and analysis that leads to paralysis, cynicism, skepticism, nihilism, and, and ultimately uh, soul importance. Uh, is, is that where thinking should go? And if, if that's what life is about at the end, why would I bother going in that direction? And so Hess has explored in Peter Kamen's said, the reductio ad absurdum of following certain ideas as they lead to certain lifestyles. He then, uh, in meeting this smaller, vibrant community in Italy, almost St. Francis style, Hesse had written an earlier little work on, or he'd done a work on Francis's of Assisi, just as he had done one on Boccaccio, the great writer of Italy who did uh, Decameron. And Decameron, like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, is very much about community, imperfect people traveling the journey of life. Uh, but staying together on the journey. Interesting enough, Boccaccio's Decameron was written in the midst of the plague. Gives it a lot of affinity in many ways as we're going through the COVID situation, obviously not as graphic or stark in its implications as Boccaccio uh, and the plague at the time. <clears throat> but Boccaccio it was about community in that sense, as was Francis of Assisi, all quite different than the isolated individual intellectual individuals that had gone through the best and finest of education, but they ceased to believe anything at all. Peter then goes back, then goes back to his home in Nippicon uh, at the end of this journey. It's sort of a there and back again story, like The Hobbit in many ways, only at a much more sophisticated intellectual, cultural, civilizational, literary level. But it's a there and back. OK, I grew up in this. It was insulated to go to the bigger world. But where does that lead in terms of a certain understanding of life and then a return to his father's a father's business? And so what you get in Peter Kamen's one of the earliest earliest novels of, of Herman Hess is in many ways some of the issues we we think through and grapple with today. Uh, issues of the family, uh, can family be counted on, the deconstruction of family by, by many today, the idealized notion of the family versus the reality, the rise of cynicism, skepticism. Peter Kamazin explores all of these, uh, 
these key works. Now, as history moved on, and Hess with history, riding the uh, wave of history, Germany at the time became increasingly so, even by the late 19th century, a nationalist move dominant, ethnic nationalism. And again, we move in this way from it's a personal ideology grappling with larger cultural, intellectual, literary issues to the much larger European political economic issues at the time and the rise of ethnic nationalism. Uh, Hesse was very worried about this. He was living in Germany at the time, and he saw this triumphalism, this nationalist triumphalism emerging, and he just he just could not abide by it. And even though he was one of the most popular writers in Germany, uh, avant-garde, cutting edge, 20th century, many were people who were heeding his his insights, particularly in Peter Kamenzid. Uh, he began to question, and many of those people themselves were very drawn to rising German nationalism. He began to question some of that and the whole notion of ethnicity, an uncritical attachment to ethnicity, uh, an attitude towards nationhood that one just genuflected before the state, what Nietzsche would call the new idol. And where it led in terms of other people and the ideological treatment of those that uh, differed with one and how they interpreted nationalism. Uh, throughout World War One, Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, did assist. He had moved to Switzerland. He began to write in some of his works, like If the War Goes On, a series of collected essays that Nietzsche wrote from World War One right through up to World War Two. He began to write very critical essays, uh, both uncritical ethnicity and uncritical nationalism, arguing very clearly when it comes to the question of human nature itself, are we defined purely and only and predominantly by our nation, by our ethnicity, or is there something deeper within uh, humanity itself in which we share a certain commonality of human nature? And so rather than shrinking human nature to a political ethos, to an ethnic background, uh, which has its place, but for Hess it was something that is a secondary because there's the primary element of our common human nature. And for Hesse, this in, primarily, he grew up in a European context, obviously acutely aware of the Indian context also, is that he would argue, first of all, yes, I am a patriot of Germany, but more importantly, I'm a patriot of humanity and humanness itself. And so when it comes to the clash between nation and humanity, I side with humanity. Hopefully they need not collide. Hopefully a meaningful understanding of humanity can be worked out within the context of a nation. But when that does not occur, then I salute more to the common nature of humanity and what humans share together. This led to immense opposition in Germany against Hesse. And Hesse became in many ways public enemy number one in Germany throughout World War one, he was vilified, he was marginalized, he was seen as uh, un unpatriotic, a traitor to his people, uh, a Judas figure. And of course, for a sensitive person like Herman Hess, this, this cut very, very, very deeply. The, uh, so throughout World War I, then, he lived in this tension. We can look at the ideology I just briefly touched on earlier of a certain type of sophisticated intellectual that leads to, to nihilism, cynicism a certain understanding of the family between ideal and reality, uh, the ideology of that. Uh, and then nationhood, the ideology of ethnicity, nationhood versus versus common, common humanity. Another thing that Nietzsche grappled with as World War I came to an end, increasingly he realized that uh, humanity lived in a global village, not just a European global village, but as I mentioned earlier, his connections to India, China and many other significant Asian countries very, very much drew him. So he became a fi key figure, not just in terms of uh, holding up European literature and the greatness and the best that has been written to overcome memoricide, which I have talked about earlier, but how do the great works of Indian literature and Chinese literature, Confucianism, uh, the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, all of these great works reflect the best in what humanity might be on their all too, too human journey. 
As a result of that, he wrote a little work just as World War I was coming to an end and into World War II, Siddhartha. And of course, most know Siddhartha as the founder of Buddhism. But Hesse's approach to Siddhartha was not about a naive turn to Buddhism. It was about the quest that a person goes on for meaning. So Siddhartha in, within Buddhism becomes the Gautama, the enlightened one. But within Hesse's particular version, Siddhartha becomes the searcher. Secularism does not answer the deeper questions of human life, the longings for meaning, the desire to grow deeper, and what is worth turning to for purpose. What are the ideas, again, that we are consciously aware of or sub or unconsciously aware of, we turn to meaning. Siddhartha grows up in a Brahmin family. His father is a lead Brahmin within India. But does the formalism of the Brahmanic ritual tradition of the Vedas satisfy? Well, it has its place, but Siddhartha is looking for something that speaks to him personally, existentially. And at a certain point, he has to say to dad, you know, uh, this is what I've grown up in. This is my context but my hunger grows deeper for something more. He then turns to the ascetics within India, the ones who give themselves to living simply, virtually with nothing, meditatively going deeper inside to ask the questions, what is the real self? Being um, back of the flux of multiple desires of what they call in India, the monkey on the tree. And so within our lives, like the tree of the life, there's like monkeys jumping all over, clamoring for attention, eager to be fed or eager to be nourished. Is there something deeper uh, than that level of the ego with its with its multiple monkeys running away in self, all wanting to be fed, to be taken care of? Uh, and with the, the meditative um, ascetics in India, he thought, in fact, that would satisfy him. And so the first two part, really, of Siddhartha is the quest to understand, in a certain religious sense, uh, are the answers there in terms of a deeper hunger? And the question has to ask throughout his journey, what is real, as I mentioned in the early quote, in terms of what is the most deeply real within at the deepest level? Uh, not what is super, superficially there, uh, the glutting of conditioned appetites, um, the commodification of appetites and how a capitalist culture uh, goes from one thing to another to both tantalize um, and then sell a product in the hope that it will give meaning and then a person goes from one thing to another. But is there something deeper within the human soul itself that says none of those things, they're mirages, they will not satisfy and often many people go from mirage to mirage in life because they don't know their deeper self, their deeper needs, uh, and even their selves in that sense. Um, Siddhartha then moves from the early part of the book to say, well, listen, um, the certain part of the Brahmanic tradition and the ascetic tradition have answered. He ends up leaving that and then begins to explore the sensual light of life. He meets a courtesan, or what today we would call a prostitute, who says, listen, you have so far denied your sensual, your sexual desires. You you have so far equated uh, denying the ego with just the sensual, but there's something deeper uh, in terms that you have to face into in all of this. And so he spends years in, in that sense uh, uh, pandering to physical desires, sensual desires, sexual desires, and this particular woman introduces him to a very wealthy businessman. And so Siddhartha then goes on in terms of worldly interests. He becomes very successful in relationships. He knows how to manipulate relationships to serve what he wants. He then also becomes an extremely wealthy business person in India. He soars, he makes a fortune, but as he ages, he begins to ask himself, well, I seem at a physical, a sensual, a material level to have achieved all I wanted, but I'm still restless. I'm still hungry for meaning. And so you get, you get Siddhartha then uh, asking the question, well, if the ascetic life and the material life don't satisfy, what does bring a deeper meaning and purpose to life? And so we're back, of course, to uh, ideology. And Siddhartha in the book, Siddhartha, one of the best read and most loved books of Hess is very short, very succinct, very compact, but worth many a read. The question again is being asked is what is worth turning to for meaning and be wary of turning to things that will only betray at the end of the journey. And how many years is someone going to spend 
uh, in areas of life that only betray and don't satisfy a deeper hunger for meaning. Uh, many other works uh, Hess wrote in exploring the darker side, um, the shadow side. He was uh, worked with Carl Jung for a time, uh, works like Damien at the end of World War, World War I, in which he was acutely aware when we look at human nature, there are these two sides. There's the, there's the positive, the meaningful, the optimistic, but they're also alongside of it like Plato's two horses. There's the dark horse. And it can work in a very subtle way. It can work in a crude way. But beware, beware that these two elements are within uh, all. And so that's a part of almost the being of each and all as they try and find their way forward. Uh, a book Hess wrote in the 1930s was Journey to the East, a very, very important work in which, a, again, contra-secularism, and of course this is an ideology, as I mentioned earlier, whether hard or aggressive secularism, which negates the human longing for the spiritual, uh, the ultimate, the infinite God, uh, and the nature of that journey itself, as the great wise women and the men of the past have articulated. Journey to the East is only in a secondary sense about going to the Orient. East, in the German title of the book, it means going to the place where the sun rises or going to the place where light emerges. And so in Journey to the East, what Hess is exploring, I might also say at the end of Siddhartha, what Hess comes to see is foundational on Siddhartha's individual quest is that it's the life of the, in this case, he becomes at the end of uh, his life a ferryman. He ferries people from one shoreline to another. He's reached a quiet, a still place in his life, an inner peace. He's no more frantic internally, no more driven erratically all over uh, the place in the search of meaning. He's found that quiet place. And the metaphor of the ferryman is the one who ferries someone from what they're leaving behind in their journey across the turbulent water of time to the shoreline of meaning and of purpose. And in that sense, Siddhartha comes to see that the deepest meaning in life as in fact serving others, helping them on the raft to move from where they don't want to be or where they're stuck on, across often the unpredictable and uncertain waters of time to the shoreline of what gives meaning. Now, Journey to the East uh, was published in the 1930s in the in the period of time, obviously, of rising German nationalism and Hitler. And what uh, Hesse was living in Switzerland at the time. And what Hesse is looking at is what is the wisdom of all the great world religions uh, and how can they be brought together to serve humankind as, as people move into the future? So Journey to the East, uh, you look at many of these uh, people from different religious traditions called the League, in which they're on the quest to think through how one lives a meaningful life. But one of the key figures in Journey to the East is Leo. The ironic thing in what Hess is in one sense is doing, he's spoofing people who are all spiritual, but do not know how to serve in a meaningful way. Leo, Leo, and they, they are on this, with this group called the League on the search. Leo is the one who packs for all of these searchers. He makes their breakfast, their food, he guides them, and uh, he seems to be an insignificant person in terms of the intensity of people who see themselves on a very uh, intense spiritual search. They know where they're going. They're with this league that is moving and is synthesizing all great religions, but he disappears at a certain point, and uh, the league falls apart, or those within the league. And the narrator of Journey to the East asks the question, uh, why did the uh, why did the uh, all these people on this search why did it come apart? Uh, and he spends much of his life as the narrator in the book asking what happened until by the end of the book he discovers that in fact uh, the league fell apart because the key person that held it together was Leo, and the, at the heart of Leo was a servant, the one who cared for them, and he was the one who really understood spirituality in a meaning sense, the one who quietly served, and only at the end is the narrator of Journey to the East understand that the head of the whole league is Leo, remembering the metaphor of Leo, Leo the lion, the one who has disciplined their desires, ordered their desires in a proper way, and what does it mean to love above all 
uh, it means to serve, it serves others. Um, I could say much more about this as many other key works of Hess. I'll just finish with his great summa, The Glass Bead Game. The Glass Bead Game is very, very much uh, set in the context of the edge of wo uh, war. Has, uh, war has ended, um, the sheer tragedy of war. Uh, cultures very, very much are superficial. You get pop media, you get media stars, you get movies, you got uh, newspapers are trivial. They're not much more like pasty in that sense. There's a whole super, uh, a whole culture of superficiality dominates in which people are thin of mind and thin of spirit and thin of soul, but they're tantalized by the trivial. Okay, it's the Roman bread and circus. Is and out of this emerged, out of this emerged uh, a group of thinkers. Uh, called the Castalians. And the Castalians, like the previous, the League uh, people, were committed to raising the level of what it meant to be human, to live uh, in a meaningful way, to recreate civilization and culture. And they brought together the very best and noblest whose vocation was to grapple with these, these issues. Uh, and these Castalians were the ones that upheld what seemed to have disappeared or passed away uh, because of war, because of pop culture, uh, because of thin journalism, because of media stars that pass like a cloud and have no substance whatsoever. The Castalians were the ones that held high uh, on the peak, as it were, uh, the great thinking of the past and tried to revive in a comparative civilizational way the future, the future of humankind after it had been de uh, devastated. Now, the dilemma, of course, is we're back with the with uh, we're back with. And this is what Hess is going to explore. And I'll wind it down here. Uh, the question always is, what is the relationship to thinking the best thoughts? the most insightful thoughts of threading together the noblest ideas. Magister Ludi was the head of the order of the Castellians, but he increasingly so. His questions were, so what's the relationship of thinking on the peaks with the best intellectuals and philosophers and theologians and meditative people? What's the relationship of that of the hurly-burly of life in the valley? Uh, because the whirly, big, whirly gig of time has a way of winnowing all things. And uh, those who only live in the busyness, the franticness, the running to and fro uh, in the valley, there's often a lack of thought. But then you can have people who are very engaged in thinking, but they shy away from commitment to public life in the valley. Magister Ludi realizes there's a disconnect between thinking and action, action and thinking. And this is what Hess is exploring, because he would have certainly have experienced that in the 20th century. Some of the finest intellectuals who are articulating the way forward to where Europe should go, where the world should go. And yet in the in the trenches of nationalism and ethnicity and fascism and Nazism and Japanese nationalism, uh, all of these these areas where power was located, where populist politics uh, took place, um, there was a frantic um, a frantic uh, coming together of collectivities who were not concerned about thinking. They wanted a Messiah figure that was going to bring people into the future, fulfill economic, ethnic, national needs. They weren't worried about thinking. And so the brittleness of the Castalians or of intellectual life when it's confronted with populism and power and nationalism, what happens? And of course, Magister Ludi in the Glass Bead Game, he makes the trip down to the valley. One of his former uh, peers and student sons asks him to train him. And Ludi is acutely aware, acutely aware of this gap between thinking and action. He agrees to go into the valley, up into the Alps to trace the sun. Uh, and he drowns in the process, uh, drowning, obviously, a metaphor, uh, losing his way in the water, uh, water of time. And the novel ends, as does most Hess's novels, with we don't know where the future is going. What's the relationship between thought and action, action and thought? And what's the implications of, of intellectuals who do not engage meaningfully in the public realm or thoughtless activists who don't think? And so the glass bead game ends with Joseph Connect, Magister Ludi, 
dying in the waters of time, drowning in the waters of time, and the future lies open in that sense. And so when we think ideology and politics, this has just been a quick skimming over the surface of the some of Hess's works, of which he was one of the most prolific writers of the 20th century. But as my uh, earlier reading from Hess, his question is, be wary of certain things that go by the name of reality. What they can do if one isn't careful, they can blind a person to the deeper issues of life that are not often not seen by the cyclops or one-dimensional thinking, as Herbert Marcuse would call it, from those who have two and three eyes or who see through the eyes of the soul. And often those who only call reality that which is presented the closest to their nose, they may act, in fact miss the deeper reality, deeper within them, and how to bring that reality in a suggestive, a poetic, a literary, a philosophic, uh, a theological, a spiritual, a med meditative way to bear. And what happens when people ignore, deny, rep repress the deeper realities for more superficial, more fleeting, more transient realities that seem to occupy most people much of the time? Well, people in that sense often lose their souls and they become the playthings of the trendy and hence by day's end, they're perpetually restless on ever, ever going on a treadmill of life, a merry-go-round of life, which leads nowhere except going round and round. And it's only when people get off that merry-go-round that the deeper reality can be probed and explored. And this is perhaps Hess's contribution in an age of ideology and politics, uh, that he asks, what are the deeper ideas worth living for? Where do they take a person internally? And what does that look like externally in the public world of education, politics, religion, culture, civilization, literature?